close with the Q and A. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to start preparing your, your questions. Open up. So I wrote them down. I have like like four questions, but I, I don't I don't have to ask them all at we'll once. We'll right? take one at a time. Okay. Well, the first one is I'm wondering what the majority opinion about praying with your arms to the side. Is it from the Sunnah according to or? Yeah. So what about? So this is more about the fiqh related to the prayer. What about what is the majority opinion on praying with your hands to the side? Um. There's some things that it's, you know, fiqh, the truth is not about the number of people who say it. Right? Truth is about what corresponds to reality. Right? So, and that's a principle that applies, you know, yeah, truth is not a matter of democratic vote. Right? We may make collective decisions on a matter of, of vote, but reality isn't on the matter of democratic vote, right? If 10 people look at this and think it's, you know, it's chocolate, but it's actually a stone, their vote doesn't turn it into chocolate, although it does happen to be chocolate. Um, so, similarly, truth in matters of Islamic law, like, in with respect to anything else in reality, it's not a matter of if more people said it means it's correct. Not necessarily. Right? Though we know that more broadly, the community of the Prophet will not unite on errors. But that, the, so that's one principle. But that doesn't follow that the majority is always right on every specific issue. Right? Um, but What is the sunnah with, re with respect to where one keeps one's hands in the prayer? There's difference of opinion. The Sahaba differed about this. The Sahaba differed about this. Why? Because they saw the Prophet ﷺ do different things. They transmitted different actions from the Prophet ﷺ. And then they differed on what those actions meant. So very interestingly, for example, the most famous narrations of where the Prophet ﷺ kept his hands in prayer, what are they? The most famous narrations are that he placed his right hand on his left, ala sadrihi, on his chest. And there's some who say, therefore it means that that's the sunnah. But interestingly, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who in his musnad, narrated no less than five different narrations about ala sadrihi, the Prophet ﷺ kept his hands quote unquote on his chest, on his sadr you know what Imam Ahmed's position was on keeping your hands on the chest? he considered it makruh according to the more famous narration from Imam Ahmed he considered it makruh and the Hanbalis, you know, the transmitters of Imam Ahmed's school they say karihahu he considered it dislike even though he transmitted it. Why? Because the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did something does not necessarily make it sunnah. Because maybe there's something that he did and then he did something else after it. So if he did one thing and then left it for another, which is the sunnah? Well, there's several possibilities. One possibility is that the later action was sunnah and the other one ceased to be. It's not so simple. Okay. That's number one. So Imam Ahmad gave preference to the narration from Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib, mentioned in the Sunan of Abu Dawood and elsewhere, and mentioned by Imam Ahmad himself and others, that Sayyidina Ali said, Inna min as sunnah wadu al yumna al al yusra tahta al surra. Imam Ahmad considered the, the you know, th this hadith that Sayyidina Ali transmitted, it's the words of Sayyidina Ali that it is the sunnah to put the right hand on the left under the navel. He considered that to be there, it's not just describing what the Prophet did, 
responsibility of later action, etc. But here Sayyidina Ali said, in the Minas Sunnah, it is of the Sunnah to do this. And this is actually the position of Imam Abu Hanifa as well. Imam Malik used to give more weight to the practice of the people of Medina, of the city of the Prophet ﷺ, over individual narration from the Prophet ﷺ. So Imam Malik, looking at his teachers and looking at the people of knowledge from the scholars of Medina, he said that their, he considered their general practice to be to keep the hands on the side. Even though explicit hadith related to that, you won't find. But they only, Imam Malik considered that they only did it because this is what they understood to be the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And they were just two generations removed from the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Shafi'i, his position, he has a number of narrations, but his position is, based on the hadith of placing the hand on the chest, quote-unquote, the sunnah is to keep your hand under the chest. How could that be? Because it was understood that the hadith Actually, all four schools of Sunni Islam, between them, they agree that the hadith of placing the hands, quote unquote, on, a sadr, on the chest is not referring to, quote unquote, on the chest, does not refer to the chest itself. Because what does sadr mean? A sadr ma yasduru min shaykh. The sadr is the front part of something. So it can refer to the chest area itself, that which is below your collarbone till the bottom of your rib cage. Or it can refer to the front. So in Urdu, for example, what do you refer to the president of the university? Or the leader of a community? One of the terms for it is Sadr. Because there's at the front. So they understood that. Give How do you piece that with the other evidences? That the Sadr there is referring to the front of your body. Not necessarily the chest area. Which is why you can't just read hadith based on what what the word of the hadith says and your copy of Hans Weir, some German dude finished the of Arabic. Right? That's what it says, but what does it mean? And what does it mean? So right, so this is a matter. Who is correct depends on what how you determine correctness. So the schools of Islamic law are consistent methodologies of how you understand the Sunnah. How do you piece the evidence together? Do you just do it randomly? No. There's a consistent method to understand that. So if, if you ask Imam Malik, what is the correct opinion? He said, well, according to the method I follow, this is more correct. And if you followed his method, you'd say what he said. If you followed the method followed by Imam Shafi, the only thing you could say was the conclusion Imam Shafi came to. Because Imam Shafi didn't come to that conclusion randomly. That, well, you know, today I want to say that. No. He has a particular consistent, sound methodology of understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And if you apply that methodology, you'll come to that conclusion. And there's some things in our deen that are clear. Someone says, you know what? I was reading the Qur'an, I realized that there's eight obligatory prayers in a day. Me, that's just wrong. But there's other things that Allah chose not to make clear. And there's a wisdom in it. There's, a, there's many wisdoms in it. So these are matters that lend themselves to be understood in more than one way. And one of the beautiful aspects of our deen is we recognize that there's some matters that are clear that don't lend themselves to difference, but there's other matters that lend themselves to difference, and in those matters it is our duty to respect that difference within its recognized parameters. So what do we do? We learn a consistent way of understanding the deen and we apply that to the best of our ability. Right? So if someone follows the methodology of Imam Malik, they would come to the man, to the Imam Malik's conclusion. If someone follows another method, they follow another conclusion. That's one aspect. The other aspect is most of these differences, not always, but most of the time they tend to be on detail. They tend to be on detail. It's not a matter. Someone never put never tied their hands. No one would say that it's sinful. Because our deen has levels of ruling. There's some things that are obligatory and prohibited. Right? So 
So someone started the prayer saying, Hallelujah! Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They didn't break, begin the prayer. Right? But someone, let's say they didn't raise their hand. Did that break the prayer? No. Right? They didn't raise their hand. No one has said that it's obligatory to raise your hand. It's sunnah. Right? So there's degrees of ruling too. And most of the differences are on the detail. Do you pray two rak'ahs before Maghrib? There's different. The Sahaba differed. Are you going to be able to resolve? Am I going to be able to resolve it? No. The companions differed. And did the Prophet impose one thing on them? The Prophet surely saw some of the Sahaba continued praying the two rak'ahs before Maghrib, after Maghrib entered. And there's others who didn't. Who is more correct? Well, it depends on what methodology you follow. But the Sahaba weren't able to resolve that difference. The Imams of the Salaf weren't able to resolve that difference. They remain different. But they re the, the beautiful characteristic that prevailed in Islamic history that we neglect is the respect of the difference. That you follow what you more, hold to be more correct, but you respect the other par party's right to differ. So, so that's basically the way that we follow. There's a question online. What does it mean for personal practice that as salatu imadu deen that the prayer is the pillar of the religion? Um, there's some discussion, of course, about the hadith in terms of strength and so on. But the imad of something for a tent, for example, the imad is from is from i'timad, what something relies upon. So in a tent, the imad is the central. Um, support. That's what uh, amud, like a pillar, it's called a amud. Right? It's from it's from a similar meaning. Right? That's what the building relies upon. But the iman is what the whole thing depends upon. Right? Your religious reality is sound if your prayer is sound. And if you squander the prayer, everything else is likely to be falling apart. So the, practically one of the advantages of that is you want to see, there's the ulama mentioned, if you look, looking at this Quran, looking at the Sunnah, that there's at least three or four central barometers for the health of your deen. You want to see where you are with Allah, look at a few things. One of them, look at your prayer. How much presence of heart do you have in prayer? That's a good sense, sign for your spiritual health. Because you're praying and you know, that's when you think all your bad thoughts. I'm going to beat her up. I'm going to do this to them. You know, your prayer is a time for this fact. That it's when you think about, you know, how many episodes of whatever show you're going to watch tonight or this and that. That, that all occurs to you during your prayer means that you have some serious work to do. If you find that your presence of heart is improving in the prayer, you should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that things, other things are improving. That's one sign of the health of your deen. Another sign of the health of your deen is how you are when upset. Right? Because the Prophet was asked, what is the best of actions? He said, good character. What is good character? It's that you don't get angry when you're able to. Right? So how are you when upset? That tells you where you are in your deen. Another test of your deen is how you are in your three most critical relationships. How you are with your parents, your spouse, your children. That's a test of your deen. It doesn't matter if you're an angel around the world, but if you're a bad child, bad parent, bad spouse, that's a problem. Right? So those are a number of, of tests. The, another test is how are you when tempted? How are you when tempted? Everyone has weaknesses. When you're tempted, are you able to resist temptation? Of course, don't test it by going toward the temptation. Right? So, okay, well, let me get close to the temptation and see how I am. So that's being foolish. Because Allah tells us, Khulika al-insan al-da'ifa. The human being has been created weak. So don't test yourself. Right? But if tested, are you able to resist? So you're walking down the street, are you able to control your gaze? When you go shopping, are you able to avoid those haram things, right? 
these other matters. Um, so those are a couple of you know, tests of where you are in your deen. Another test is how easy you find it to remain in remembrance of Allah. This is a test. Another test is how much do you long to recite the Quran? And how what's the state of your heart when you finish reciting Quran? Because the person who loves Allah, how do you feel when you're parting with your beloved? You don't say, yes, finally I get rid of the way that's going away. Great. That you'd you'd find it difficult to leave the one you love. What is you know, what is the your intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? One of those points of intimacy is is the Quran. If you leave the Quran like a lover leaves their beloved, and you kind of have to drag yourself away from it, that's a good sign. If you're like, great, done, put it away, let's get back to dunya, that's not a good sign. Um, there's a question. I don't know if I said Mishu. I don't know who Mishu is. My name is Faraz. Can you make dua in English too or just in Arabic while in sujood? Um, with the basis is that the, you, the, the prayer is in Arabic. Yeah. So you, the sunnah, the, what is sunnah, what is proper, that you, you, in the prayer you only make dua in Arabic. What if you don't know much Arabic dua? Then what they say, you make general dua and intense specific meaning. So you, you want to say, oh Allah, make me of your most beloved servant. You don't know how to say that in Arabic, you just say, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. And, or you say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana. O Lord, grant us good in this life and good in the next, and with good in the next, you intense the specific meanings that you seek. So that's superior. Then the, within the schools of Islamic law, they differ. Does, does making dua in other than Arabic invalidate the prayer? Some said, yes, it does. In the Hanafi school, it's improper, but it doesn't invalidate the prayer. And that's a matter of, of difference of opinion um, regarding that. Um, right? Yeah, so when do you make dua in the prayer? You make dua in the prayer in the, in the sujood, or you make dua in the prayer? Before the salam. Yes. After you make the tasbih. So you make the three tasbih or more, and then you can make dua. But within the prayer, the proper thing is to make dua for next worldly matters. And because the Prophet said, No human speech befits this prayer of ours. And there's a beautiful context to that hadith in that it used to be permitted to talk in the prayer. So one of the companions, he'd gone on a journey. And then the prohibition came in the, to you know, remain against speech in the prayer. So he, jo he returned from travel and the farm prayer was going on in the masjid. So he entered the masjid. And before you could talk in the prayer, if there was a need. So he asked, what rakah are you guys in? Everyone was quiet. Now, that's disrespectful. You know, not answering someone. Actually, one of my teachers called during the seminar, um, and I noticed, so I answered the phone and kept talking. So just he, so you know that I called. I'm a bit of a Bedouin in that sense. <laughs> I he's been calling for a few days. I talked to him briefly yesterday, but then I got home and fell asleep. I didn't call him. But. You know, that's disrespectful. Not to answer an Arab, they take it very seriously. So he got upset. So he started, why are you guys quiet? He got very angry. And some people started clapping. Some people started saying, subhanAllah. Right? Because they're praying and he's distracting them. And secondly, they can't talk. So he got very, very angry. And actually, this poor guy, he also stumbled, according to one narration. And so it, it got quite, quite a come Afterwards, people were upset with him. The Prophet said, just took him by the hand and took him to the side. And he didn't criticize him nor rebuke him. He just said to him that no human speech befits this prayer of ours. And he took this. 
the Sahabi said, Wallahi, I've never met a teacher like the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't criticize me, he didn't put me down. He just told me what was correct and explained it to me. So, um, <laughs> but based on that, no human speech is befits this prayer of ours. You, in the prayer, you avoid asking Allah for things you could ask from people. That's what you do after the prayer. You want to ask, you want, you want, you know, oh Lord, won't you grant me a Mercedes Benz? Make that dua afterwards. Because you could go ask you know, your, your rich friend. You know, Uncle, Uncle Sayyid, Uncle Sayyid, could you, get, could you give me a Mercedes Benz? You might say, but that's too big of a loan. But you could conceivably, reasonably ask someone. You could ask your parents or, or someone else. So you don't ask for that in the prayer. Um, but if someone did, there is some leeway for that. Um, when we say Rabbi, what are some of the keys to beholding his closeness to us as opposed to just our closeness to him? You have to nurture these meanings. Right? Because meanings aren't things that you just say, okay, from, from today I'm going to realize how close Allah is to me. Or how, right? Those meanings need to be nurtured. And how do you nurture them? By consistency in turning. By consistency in turning. Is prayer the most difficult thing in our deen? Everyone has different tests. Everyone has different tests. Um, you sort of touched upon it earlier. Uh, in winter or we missed, we're late. Uh, so sometimes it's maghrib and we didn't pray asr. Um, just in that example, in the daytime, we don't read aloud. So if you're praying Asr in the Maghrib time, do you we read aloud? So if a prayer gets missed, and so it's a quiet prayer, and you're making it up at the time when you recite out loud, you make it up as you missed it. Right? In the sense that, so if it was a quiet prayer, you make it up quietly. Um, just as if you miss a prayer while traveling, when you make it up, how do you make it up? as you missed it. So you make it up shortly. Right? Um, yeah. Is there a version that does not Assalamu alaikum no it's Assalamu alaika Ayyuhan Nabi. It is, there is a narration from Ibn Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that he used to say, Assalamu ala nabi wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi without the direct address after his lifetime. But, and some people really like that because they consider the other one to have some problems. But the most famous narration of the tashahud was taught by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud himself. So while the, the Shafi'is, for example, prefer the tashahud the of Abdullah ibn Umar, correct? Right? Um, because it's a question of which one is the stronger narration. But most of the scholars of hadith, and certainly the, <laughs> the Hanafis and others too, prefer the tashahud of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And that's what he used to teach. So the, that narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is weak. And it's not across the four schools. You say, As-salamu alayka ayyuhan nabi. Either bringing to mind that address between the Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Mi'raj, or addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa That may Allah, you may, it's like you're making dua to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and, and that's been the, the majority position within Islamic scholarship. Um, is it... Sunnah to make the number of tasbih in sajda an odd number? Yes. It's superior. It's not incumbent. Like there's some people are bad with numbers. Like after three, I get lost in numbers. So you don't have to, like if you're going to lose concentration, uh, your concentration is more important than keeping track of the numbers. And, or you're praying at night and you, you know, <coughs> you're going to forget. They say the simple way to do it is make one tasbih say, Subhana Rabbi Allah. Adim, and then say them in pairs. So you say one, and then say it in pairs. Subhanahu wa taala, Subhanahu wa 
Subhanallah al-Azim, Subhanallah al-Azim. Keep saying it in pairs. But that's not easy, because then you said one slowly and then you forgot. Did you say a pair or not? Don't worry about it. But if you can, it's better to stop at an odd number. Yeah? You raise your hand? I mean, that's a matter of difference between the schools, right? The Prophet is reported to have raised his hand, going in and out of Rukur, and also reported not to have raised his hand. And then the Sahaba differed. Both the Sahaba pretty much agreed that he did raise his hand, and sometimes he didn't. Then they differed which was the gen either which was the general sunnah, number one, or number two, what was the final practice of the Prophet. So the Malikis and the Hanafis said, no, the final practice, we acknowledge that yes, he did raise his hand, but the final practice was that he didn't. The Shafi'is and others said no. That he did raise his hand, so we're going to raise them too. And that's a matter of difference. So one learns a sound, consistent way of following the sunnah. What are the tools of Islamic law? They, they are sound, consistent methods of <coughs> understanding and operationalizing the sunnah of the Prophet There's a question online. You, you mentioned the importance of planning ahead with regard to prayer time, especially in winter. Um, if it's difficult to stick to the later Asr time, are we allowed to pray Asr by the earlier Asr time? Both Asr times have basis in the Hanafi school. Right? And if it's going to be easier for you to follow the earlier time, then, then do so. But it's important to take the means to pray on time. Right? So I mentioned the example, like, you know, if you really need to go to the toilet, you find some way of going to the toilet, even if you're, you're commuting. And, you know, like, you gotta go, you gotta go. You gotta pray. You, and just figure out a way of doing it. Simple as that. And really, a lot of the, one thing is, don't take yourself too seriously. No one really cares what you're doing. No one really cares what you're doing. Right? It's like, you know, twice on Young Street, I've been with people, I said, oh, there's a naked guy walking down the street. I actually looked the other way. No one was looking. I didn't look towards the naked guy. And one of the sunnahs, of course, if you're out and about, the sunnah is, don't look around unnecessarily. You all know there's the naked guy that way. Okay? But the other aspect of it is, like really, no one really cares. Right? Especially there's enough people doing weird things. You're just one more weird person to the mix. Right? That's one. Number two, like I end up having to travel quite a bit around the world and leave different places, been to redneck areas and this and that. And one of the ways not to get hassled when you pray is to pray in a dignified way. If you pray in accordance with the sunnah, you're performing the most beautiful of human action. Right? And someone seeing that couldn't help but be impressed. You're not praying for, to impress anybody, but they'll respect your prayer. If you pray like you're in a rush, right? if you don't have enough self-respect to pray properly, someone looking at you will notice, oh, what was this guy doing? What was this person doing? And so I found the only time I've had any hassle when I've prayed outside, like prayed in airports or here and there, is, you know, like I'm in a bit of a rush because I want to board the plane, so I prayed a little quickly. Yeah, I'll get some glares. But anytime you do it well, typically, people respect. I've, told, I, I've lost count. Some people come up and say, God bless you, sir. Because it's a, it's a big, it's a pretty impressive if someone, like it's winter and, it's, it's, you know, you've stood outside in the cold and you prayed. People admire that. Uh, but not, not that you do it for their sake. But you find a quiet corner or whatever, you, you just do it. And the, the preventative way is plan beforehand. Last question. Um, we'll take two questions and we'll end. If, uh, if you miss a uh, Asr Salah, so like Maghrib time coming, what Salah you pray for? So if you miss one prayer, like you miss the Asr prayer and it's Maghrib time, you pray the Asr prayer first, then you pray the Maghrib. And the, the proof for that is that at the Battle of the Trench, the Battle of the Trench, because of Al-Ahzab, it's also called the Battle of the Confederates, because there's many, the Quraysh had gathered many different tribes and so on against the, against the Muslims, and the Muslims dug a trench around Medina on the advice of Salman al-Farisi, because this is one thing they used to do in the Persian land. In the heat of battle, the Prophet and the companions 
for the seat in, in that part of the battlefront, they weren't able to pray Zuhr on time, nor Asr on time, nor Maghrib on time. And then they, the fighting finally stopped or died down at Isha time. So the Prophet ﷺ gave adhan and pray, and iqamah and prayed Zuhr, then did so for Asr, then did so for Maghrib, then he prayed Isha. Right? And so, and, it, and there's a couple of other incidents in the, in the Sunnah um, where that happens. So you observe the order. Is doing so obligatory? In, in the Hanafi school they said yes, observing that order is obligatory. So there's different opinion. In the Hanafi school, one would go to, go discreetly to the side, pray it quickly, but not hasten, and then join the Maghrib. But you don't do it right behind the line, right? Like you come here to the Dawah Center for example, just go into the basement, pray it quickly, come up, and join it. Um, and there's different things. In the Shafi school, you could pray Maghrib first and then pray the Asr. So th those are matters that are, there's different opinion on. Um, what could be done to help someone who has given up on prayer because of work or school in the West? Sometimes you don't deal with the, the symptom, but you look at the cause. So you have a friend who doesn't pray. Now you could keep giving a hassle. Pray, pray, pray. Or you could see what is the underlying problem. Right? What is the underlying problem? They may be either they're stuck in some sins that are weighing them down. And some people feel guilty that I'm committing these sins. Sometimes it may be a crisis of faith. Maybe they've fallen into bad company. Right? So part of wisdom is that you don't deal with just the symptoms, but you deal with the underlying causes. Right? So it's not that you don't care, especially if it's a repeated problem. Right? You, try, you try to understand what's the issue and you deal with that. Right? Um, and part of it is also you, you find a way of encouraging the person. Right? You're encouraging the person. Sometimes you tell the person, but they, they know. Do you have to pray at Maghrib time? They know. But they don't find that encouragement, that inspiration. Sometimes you have to encourage. Sometimes you have to inspire. Sometimes you just have to facilitate. Right? So you want someone to start praying, what do you do? Go for lunch with them. So you pray Zuhr with them, and they say, okay, let's meet up at the Dawah Center, although there's not much to eat around here. But let's say you met up at the Dawah Center, or you just say, okay, let's meet for coffee. And then you pray Zuhr, so you say, okay, let's just go pray Zuhr. You don't have to tell them anything. You're going for Zuhr. Most people won't stand outside. They'll just come in, they pray Zuhr. Then you had lunch, then you pray the Asr with them, and then you parted. Right? So they pray two prayers. And you know, you facilitate. You facilitate good company. And that's one way of steering people towards the good. It's just to facilitate it for them. Okay. Last, last question. Yeah. In the silent prayer? Like when you're not reciting behind the Imam? And so if you're praying behind the Imam and you're not reciting, what do you do? You bring to mind these meanings. They say you... You know, and that's actually they say one of the wisdoms of being silent behind the imam, right? That you know, the, it's also teaching the heart to stir those meanings, the sense of standing before Allah, the sense of yearning, the sense of awe, to move the heart with those meanings. Right? Like, what do you do when you pray to the, the, you know, pray to Rawih behind the imam? You don't know what's going on. You stir these meanings. You stir the, the, those meanings in your heart. So we'll stop there, bismillah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi